Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little. I'm here today with the 140th episode of Weekly Poker Hand. That is a lot of hands. I hope everyone's had a great week. Today we have another hand from a $1,000 buying event. Everyone folds to me in the cutoff at 150, 300, and I make it 700, so pretty standard raise. Maybe I can make it a little bit bigger given our starting stacks were about 24,000, so about uh, 80 big lines or so. Um, but whatever, I don't think it matters so much. So I make it 700, and then a loose aggressive kid makes it 1700 on the button. And when it folds back around to me, I think calling is the only option. We have a hand that's going to flop sets sometimes. We have pocket sixes. It's a great spot to be in. And we are just trying to flop a set. So the flop comes 10-6-2 with two clubs. I have the six of clubs. So if you look back to last week's episode, I led in a spot with bottom pair with a bunch of backdoor draws. And... If you think back to that episode, I said I would lead with my draws and also with my premium made hands. And this is a little bit of a different situation than the previous week because in that situation, there was a preflop raise and I called in the big blind. Here, I raised in someone three bet. So they're not quite the same situation. But let's see if I put my money where my mouth is. Let's see if we can throw out a lead here. And I do. I bet 2,500 into the 4,075 pots. So about a 60% pot bet. I think this is a fine play. Obviously, check raising is also fine. This is a scenario, though, if you look at this board, where if I ever have the gut shot straight draws, I don't really want to check raise with those. This would be 9-7, 9-8, and 8-7. Also, if I could ever have 5-4 suited or 4-3 suited, probably not 5-3 suited, those are also hands that you'd really like to lead with. Because notice if you check raise and get re-raise, you have to fold, and that's a pretty big disaster. Uh, With flush draws, if you check raise and get re-raised, I mean, I don't really see how you can fold. So with flush draws, I think it's fine to play a big pot. You're not loving playing a big pot, but it's acceptable. Whereas if you check raise with the gut shots, you do have to fold if your opponent sticks around, and that's a little bit dicey. So if you could ever bet the flop and the turn with your straight draws and make your opponent fold, hands like ace-king, ace-queen, pocket nines, etc., that's going to be great for you. So I'm not going to say this is my standard line at all. I probably lead here with any portion of my range, like 5% of the time or something like that. But if there is a board to do it, this is a pretty nice one, assuming those hands are in your range, assuming the gut shots are in your range. If the gut shots are not in your range, you probably just want to add this to your check-raising range and check-raise with your sets. Also, you'll find that check raising in this spot doesn't get very much credit at all, but neither does leading. And the reason it doesn't get credit is because it's really hard to have anything. So if it's really hard to have anything, or especially anything that's really great like a set, if you just play your hand strongly, you often will get paid off. So it turns it two. And notice now the pot is 9,000. I have 25,000 in my stack, and I bet 5,500. I think I probably could have, gone off, could have gone a little bit bigger. This is going to set up a pot size shove on the river. And I would like to have a little bit less than a pot size shove. So maybe I, if I was playing this hand today, I would have made it 6,000 on the turn. That would make it a little bit nicer going to the river. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, this, this is If you're going to continue betting, which I definitely think you should, this is a fine bet size. Now, you may be thinking you want to check to slow play when you turn a full house because your opponent's almost certainly drawing dead or nearly dead. The problem with that is that a lot of players will check behind with all of their marginal made hands, like pocket nines and ace-king, because they realize that if they bet and get action, they're always beat, whereas if they check it down, they win a lot of the time. So this is a spot where you definitely want to continue betting. Do not slow play. That would be a big mistake. Oh, I actually had my stack wrong. turns out I have 15,000 remaining in my stack. Um, We had 20,000 going to that street, not 20,000 after I bet. My apologies. So this does make a lot of sense. So now I have 14,000 on the river, the pot's 20,000, and this is a much better ratio to where we're going to get called a lot. If I was betting 20,000 into 20,000 on the river, we may um, get our opponent to fold a lot, but whenever you're betting 14 into 20, your opponent's going to be a little bit more inclined to call. I would have perhaps sized my bets differently if I was bluffing here, and you know that's something you can do from time to time, but clearly if your opponent knows that you size your flop turn of river bets differently, based on your hand strength, that's obviously a problem. So against really good players, you certainly want to use the same bet sizes in all situations. But against some amateur players, maybe you check raise 
small on the flop, bet a little bit smaller on the turn and make a big shove on the river to try to get them off of all hands worse than a 10. Whereas against pros, you probably just want to do the same thing with the whole range to remain somewhat balanced. Now, when you get here on the river with our pocket sixes, we're obviously going to go all in, but you also want to think about the rest of your range. And if my range here is exactly 10 sixes and twos, there are only three combinations of tens, three combinations of sixes, and one combination of twos. It's not very many. So seven combinations. That means I can effectively bluff with about four combinations of hands at this point, if you want to be unbalanced. So which four combinations would we pick? If you show up here with nine, seven, nine, eight, and eight, seven, well, that is, well, let's assume we play only the suited versions. That is 12 combinations of hands right there total. So way too many. We can only bluff with four of them. And it's really hard to know which ones to use and if you should go for it this exact time. Um, if you have all the five fours and five threes in your range, then you have way too many bluffs and you cannot bluff with all of them. So you should give up unless you expect to have a lot of fold equity versus your opponent for one reason or another. Um, if, if some of these numbers are confusing to you, definitely check out pokercoaching.com. We discuss this type of thing in our homework question webinars. We discuss how to balance ranges and whatnot. So make sure you check that out at pokercoaching.com. Um, anyway, this is a spot where we're certainly shoving this hand and all of our nut hands, but you must be careful not to bluff too often because if you are bluffing too often, your opponent can just call with everything and then we lose. Like, I mean, I guess the reason I'm saying this is because this is a spot where it's very easy to bluff too much because I just told you I'm playing all the nine eights and whatnot in the same way on the flop and the turn. And if we do that, we're going to arrive to the river with way too many combinations of bluffs. And if you arrive to the river with way too many combinations of bluffs, that's a problem. If you are ever bluffing with more than, like say your rain, well, we know we have seven combinations of nut hands, like I just said. So if we're ever bluffing with more than seven combinations of hands ever, then you're bluffing way too often. That's assuming you are making a gigantic all-in bet as well. If you are betting the size of the pot, you want to have about two-thirds value hands and one-third bluffs, which is why in this scenario I said we needed at most four combinations of bluffs because we're betting um, seven combinations of value hands, so you need to have about, well, in reality, three combinations of bluffs. So this is why where it's very easy to bluff too much, and this is where a lot of players get themselves in trouble because they arrive to the river with nine high and they realize oh, I need to bluff with this because it's nine high. They also don't realize they're arriving there with eight highs and maybe even five highs. And if they're bluffing with all those, their opponents can just call every time and then they lose. So be careful that you're not bluffing too much. But at the same time, this is clearly an all-in with this hand. It's very important to think about your whole range when you're playing poker, not just how you play your specific hand. Because if you only think about your specific hand, you're going to end up getting in trouble because quite often the ideal way to play your specific hand is not the ideal way to play your range. Maybe we should retitle this podcast Weekly Poker Range. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. <laughs> um, also, you know, if you want to look at your range and try to think about it, we have this uh, tool we developed for floatthetern.com called the Float the Turn Range Analyzer. And that might be a good tool for you all to play around. You can type in which hands fall in which portions of your range, either your premium made hands or whatever you want to call them, like your premium made hands, your, bl your bluffs, your marginal made hands, etc., and you can see how many combinations you arrive to each street with, and that will give you a better idea of how often you should be bluffing or which hands you should be giving up with. So anyway, that's going to be it for this episode. Thank you all very much for being here today. If you have any questions or comments, definitely let me know. I will talk to you next week.